My name is Ben Azulai, known as King Azulai. No, I'm drifting, catch you slipping, won't be back in bed. We know what we want in life, we go out there and we get it. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about sales and business and how we started, where I started this whole journey, you know, of doing sales and really creating a lot of money in my life. And the most of the money that I've made in the beginning came from me selling myself. And within time, I took my brother into the business. He was still young. Uh, we're three and a half years apart. So once uh, he got out of high school, graduated, which I didn't graduate, but he did. Fucking smart ass. And um, yeah, we just brought him into the business and the guy became a fucking legend. So let's talk about that today and hope you guys will enjoy the show. Let's well, go. Let's go. What's going on, Dylan? In the let's fucking go. house again <laughs> for this fucking third episode. Second, I'm on this, or no, I was on the second one. Yeah, now I'm on the third one. Let's go. So, yeah, for me, I was horrible fucking salesman. Do you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> I was a horrible salesman. I came out of high school. I was 17 years old, and uh, my dad told me I have two choices in life. He's like, go to school, and you know, I'll pay for all your bills. Or the second option, he said, go do whatever you want, but you got to pay for your own shit. And I followed in my brother's footsteps. So he was a number one salesman, you know, in his company that he was working in. And uh, he brought me on to work. And I was the shyest kid. I was horrible. I could not even, you know, every time I would go out to clients' houses and knock on their door, I would be nervous as fuck to, like, see what, who's going to open that door and what the conversation is going to be about. It was just a horrible, you know, first, uh, like it was just so, I was so nervous. Anxiety almost. Anxiety, my palms let's, are sweaty. Let's start this shit from the beginning. Let me tell you guys how it all started. Pretty much from the time that I was about 15, I dropped out of high school. And at that time, I started to work with my dad. And we were doing construction. Before that, I even started working with my dad. But, you know, as soon as I dropped out, I was able to do more full time. And as soon as I started working with him, I was actually just a trash man. I was literally picking up trash, demoing places. It sucked. It was a horrible job, but I knew that I was going to make money. And I won't forget, my dad told me, I'm not worth more than 50 bucks a day. And I was, I was fine with it because $50 a day, you know, I was living at the house and it was fine. But when I was 17 and he took me out of the house and was like, you can't be here anymore. I was a troublemaker. I understand completely where he was coming from. You know, I was constantly fighting people left and right. And it wasn't, it wasn't like a place. I wasn't the kind of kid that you'd probably want to have at home at the time. You know, my mother was going through cancer and I just kind of lost it at that time. But after that, as soon as I got out of the house and I started to work, and some shit kind of hit the fan at some point when I was 18 and when I got out of jail at that point, I was like, fuck it, that's it. I'm never, I'm never going back there. They're never going to see me. I'm going to go do everything that I have to do. And I ghosted the world. I ghosted the fucking world. I came out of jail. I had a motorcycle at the time, a GSX-R 600. And <laughs> you remember I went over to Aroma yeah. Cafe on Ventura. I saw this beautiful girl and I said, that's going to be my woman. And that was a woman that I changed for, you know, I changed a lot of my life for her because I was like, okay, I got a beautiful woman at home. I got to support her. And uh, I did everything I needed to do. So I started cleaning carpets. Then after that, you know, people heard that I'm doing really good in sales and I went into selling air conditioning. And from that time, by the time I was 19 and a half, I believe, or yeah, almost 20, the guy who I was working with made me a business partner. And about a year after that, I brought my brother in to work because I was 21. My brother was 18 and I brought my brother to work with me. My dad, you know, he got the better end of the stick uh, because, you know, my dad was very tough on me. I think by the time it got to my brother, he was very tired and didn't want to be tough anymore. So you took that role. <laughs> yeah, I took the role of <laughs> getting so messed up. But uh, as time went by, you know, my dad was like, 
hey, Dylan, if you want, you could go to school. Now I got the money. I'll pay for your schooling or you go to work. One of the two. And Dylan uh, was somebody who was very lazy, very shy, very introvert. Wasn't somebody that could do a sale, even if, the life, even if his life depended on it. But within time, when he came with me and we were going door to door, you know, and meeting new clients. And then once he got the hang of it, I mean, tell us, you remember the first time you were like shaking next to me, like, who's going to open the door? Yeah, it was a horrible experience. <laughs> I didn't want to just get, go back home. <laughs> I didn't want to see another day out on the field, knocking on doors, walking in the hot sun. It was like something I never imagined to do. But then I, at the same time, I was like, this is the only option I have. I didn't know like what else to do. You know, so I just was like, this is what my brother does. This is my dad's in construction, you know, so this is like what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. And, you know, doing the door to door thing, it was like a horrible experience. And but, we're Israeli, every Israeli. Yeah, every Israeli, in LA. every Israeli, you know, <laughs> all you Americans here in L.A., you guys for sure see an Israeli salesman probably once or twice, you know. A year. A year. You You're know, calling come, for air conditioning replacement. You got a Jewish guy. You You're got, going for insulation. A Jewish. It's, you got construction. Jewish. It's well, always. Your kitchen. <laughs> it's the Jew. Yeah. No matter what, you'll always fall on one Jewish person. And we give you the best price. You know, the end of the day, you get the number one price. What do you mean? They call you from the ad. The ad said forty nine ninety nine. What do you mean forty nine ninety nine? How can I sell you for forty nine ninety nine? I would lose money. It cost me more for gas. Yeah. You tell me, but the ad says it. Who you gonna believe? Me or the ad? I'm here. I tell you, it's not forty nine ninety nine. What you crazy? <laughs> At the end of the day, they fall in love with you and they buy. It doesn't yeah. matter. You're yeah. selling yourself, and the fact that. And I'm going to tell you guys some fucking stories right now that are going to make you shit your pants. But before I tell you these stories, Dylan here would come into a home and thinking that he's going to face like a fucking whole Spartan army. Yeah. But then some like 55 year old woman opens the door and goes, hello. <laughs> and Dylan's like, hi. And all of a sudden the cat starts to like get involved or a dog and... and the Dylan. daughter, the husband, the, you know, the they son, loosen everything loosens up. Yeah. And but no, it just it happened definitely like over time, repetition, repetition, talking and more and more clients every single day. You know, it gets easier and easier. But the first few months was horrible. I, you know, driving to people's houses. I did not close any jobs. I would ask Ben for a loan for gas. You know, I would tell him, hey, bro, I, I need money for gas to get to the client's house this week and he would front me money every week so I can get to these clients. He at least believed in me. I didn't believe in myself. Right. But he kept coming to me. He's like, don't worry. One day it'll happen. You'll be good. You'll be good. You'll be good. Just like the gym. You know, you go to the gym. You're not going to see results the same, you know, the same day or the next day. It takes time. You have to build the muscle. You have to break it down. Same thing with like who you are as a person. You have to break yourself down and kind of find out what works for you. And you learn a little bit from one person to the next. You, you know, you go with this sales guy, this sales guy, this sales guy. And from there and on and on. You see what works for you. You see what works for you. You take a little bit from every single person. You kind of just make your own little sauce, yeah. you know, where you go to these clients. And now you're just saying some of what other salesmen are saying, but then you're also saying, you know, your own words. And uh, you just get better and better at it. With your sure. own energy. One with your own the... energy. Today, when I walk into a client's house, I'm like... I feel like I know them for my whole life. You know, I knock on the door. I'm so happy for that person to open the door so I can start a conversation. Yeah. When before it was like... You were hoping that they I, wouldn't open the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, before I was hoping that... I remember Ben would one day, one day call me and he's like, so how's the leads going? And I was standing outside and I was like, oh, I didn't go inside yet. He's like, well, go inside, call me after. I knocked one time so light and nobody answered the door. And I waited five minutes and I called Ben. I'm like, hey, Ben, nobody answered the door. He's like, well, let me call the client. I'm like, no, no, I called the client. No, don't call them. No, everything's fine. <laughs> and he's like, no, let me call. I'll call them for you. I'm like, no, no, it's fine. Nobody's home. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm heading back home. He's like, stay right there. Let me call. I let him call. He's like, oh, the lady's coming out in five minutes. Yeah. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like, yeah. now I have to talk to this lady. And you know, guys, I used to have like a huge telemarketing crew. I mean, I had about 150 people working in the office was uh, multiple offices full of people and these are all guys that are felons drug addicts they're in rehabs but they needed a job you know some homeless people 
and they constantly would have fights in my office, people outside doing heroin, and you have to deal with them. You know, it's much harder to deal with people like that and when you have so many of them in one room because they constantly don't like each other. Also, I was hiring a lot of African-American people and then a lot of white people and then Hispanics. And the mix of the three um, from the people who have been in prison, you know, or been in jail and they don't like each other. It's like, how do I explain to them right now that this is a job and they need to like each other or if they don't like each other, it's fine. Just don't fight on the job. And I would constantly like have talks with them. And you're talking about 150 people that I was literally like a dad babysitting a school. I remember you like standing on the garden. I remember you standing. You had like a little stage right at the yeah. right when you walk I in the door. The stage, right guys. when you walk in the door <laughs> on the right side, there's like a stage with like a table on it, and you had the microphone, and right. you're talking to 150 people. Guys, it felt like a show every day. So take a look. <laughs> there was they started to cause a lot of problems. So I said, you know what? Fuck it. All the offices are in one building. I'm going to open up all the walls and make it into one huge office. So we had like 12 offices and all of them would just open up all the walls. And I built a freaking stage. Mic, speakers, camera, action. It is on, guys. It was on. I'd get up there and I'd explain to them what friendly means, what love means, what care means, how to get farther in life. How to do the things that will not get him in trouble anymore. Not go back to jail. Not do drugs. So I became like a super babysitter. And it was very, very difficult. Every morning you're dealing with something. Throughout the day you're dealing with a million things. And then in the evenings as well. It's a lot of like he said, she said. Oh, he said this to me. Oh, she said this to me. It was crazy. But I remember you you made them uh, like a like you made it a fun experience because you build right. like a spin the wheel game mm -hmm. where they can win like cash prizes and like all these extra stuff and bonuses. So it was like it, I, it was it was basically like a kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, it was it was amazing though. But the craziest thing to me was sometimes I would give one of them a bonus and the idiot would run and tell people that he just got a bonus. And then I got 150 people crying why they didn't get a bonus. And go explain to them that that guy would bring you 20 leads a day and they're bringing five leads a day. So he's pretty much as good as four people. Of course, I'm going to give him a bonus. But that's the problem. You know, some people don't even know how to keep their mouth shut. Or he would smoke weed and then he would just run his mouth, not thinking it was going to bite him in the ass later. So there was a lot of trouble with that. But at the end of the day, I knew that work needs to get done and we're going to do this business and we're not going to stop and it brings money and it brought a lot of money and we were doing it all of san fernando valley all the way to calabasas then we went down all the way to santa barbara and on the other side we went you know orange all the county. way to orange county anaheim and the guys were driving a lot but they knew that if they get inside of a house they're coming out with money and when we did sales, you know, we pay our guys. We, I used to pay the guys a lot of money. It's not like going to work hourly rate. You're working on commission base only. But commission base means you get to determine what you're making today. And it all depends on your performance. If you go inside of a house and decide I'm going to give a million percent, then you're going to come out with a sale. And if you're going to go in there and come out and, you know, like a dick, not being kind to the people, not, you know, being polite, sweet, asking questions that are required to ask, you know, when you're doing a sale. Like if I'm sitting in front of a client, I want to know what his issues are with his home, whether he wants a kitchen, whether he wants a bathroom, what bothers him. And then we constantly would drill about the problems that he has. And it's called stirring the pain. When you stir the pain in a sale, or we have something called price conditioning. You know, I'd get into a home and somebody wants to get a kitchen done. He's like, okay, I want to get this kitchen. I got quotes. I'd like to know how much it's going to cost me. No problem. As we're in through the sale, oh yeah, I just did a kitchen like that, a little bit bigger than yours. And let's say I want to sell them for 55000 Yep, it was $82,000, but don't worry, it was a little bit bigger than yours. Then you see what the reaction of the person is. Does he look at you and he's like, whoa, 
Or does he look at you and he's not even phased? It like it didn't say much to him. So it's called price conditioning. So then when I tell him it's going to cost him $70,000, he looks at me and goes, well, I have to think about it. If he says, I have to think about it, you probably didn't do the sale right. Something went wrong. Now you got to go from the beginning and explain who you are and what kind of person you are and what kind of value you're bringing because you didn't sell yourself very well. But no matter what, you start at 70 and then you start giving them deductions you know, little discounts. Okay, well, it's 70, but let me see if I have some extra material in my warehouse. Let me see what we got for you. Let me go ahead and call the office. Now I call the office. What do I do? I create some sort of a pressure on the client. Hey, pick up my phone, call the manager, and I'm the owner. I call the manager and I say, hey, what's going on, buddy? Good, good. Listen, um, Honestly, I'm here with a client. He's a great guy. I've sat with him for the past two and a half hours. He's interested. He's ready to go. When I say he's ready to go, I'm planting in his head that he's ready to go and he's committed to me. That's why I'm making this call for him. And taking consideration, I'm not talking to anybody. I talk to myself. But I make a fake call to show him that I care about him and I want to fight for him. And that's what I used to do, guys. I used to fight for that sale. Then I would tell him, let me check. I think we have in our warehouse some extra materials. And he'd be like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Let me see what we could do for you. Hey, Michael, check for me the warehouse. Check, you know, B26 should be in the back over there. For sure we have some of this material. Okay, I'll wait. I wait. As I wait, I'm talking to the client. Then boom, bring the phone back. Oh, great. You got it. Awesome. How much discount can I give him? Oh, I could give him three and a half thousand dollar discount. And then I put the phone down and I say, I'm going to give you three and a half thousand dollar discount, but we're going to have to sign it today. And he goes, oh, it's not enough. I, can you do a little bit more? The second he said that, can you do a little bit more? That means he's in negotiation with me. He's in negotiation. He's ready to buy. All we need to do is discount a tiny bit more, but slowly. We don't want to do it quick because whatever comes quick doesn't sound that good. You got to show that you're fighting for him. And then I go, you know what? Hold on a second. Michael, listen, I need a little bit more. Can you do five off? Yes, he's going to bring us referrals. And watch what I do now. He's going to bring us referrals. Right, sir? You're going to bring us referrals? And, you nod your and head. he nods his head as I nod my head. And he goes, yes. That means he just said yes to the job. And as I do this, I go, and with the referrals that you're going to bring us, promise me you're not going to tell him the price that we just gave you, right? And he goes, right, of course. And then I put my hand down and I go, you trust me to do the job for you, right, sir? And he goes, yes, as I nod my head, making him say yes. And then I say, okay, sounds great. You know what? But I want to see if I could get something a little bit more for you. Hold on a second. But it's a deal. Congratulations. Listen, Michael, I'm going to give him a $6,000 discount right now. And this is, I know, I, I, Michael, I understand. But don't worry. I'm telling you, he's going to bring us a lot of referrals. The guy knows the whole neighborhood. He's lived here for 45 years. Taking consideration, I'm talking to a 40-year-old man. And I just said to Michael that he's lived there for 45 years. So I'm showing him that I'm willing to lie to my manager to get him a better price. And he goes, yes, I will. And I go, okay, Michael, thank you so much. Go ahead and put, that, put all that uh, extra material on the side because we're going to use it. And we're going to start the job on Monday. Sure, I'll write him up right now. Thank you. But put it on the side for me. Don't forget. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Put down the phone. Congratulations, sir. I'm so glad that you allow us to do business with you. You're not going to. I promise you. Thank you. Come you, again. <laughs> you, will not, you will not be disappointed. And I can tell you, I close every single sale like that. Every single sale. And in construction, you sell times two and a half. So if it costs you 20 grand, you sell it for 50 grand. 
And the reason is, is because there is something called a lead cost. It costs us to get those leads, right? So it's not just the cost of the job itself. The cost of the job was $20,000. Then we also had to have a full telemarketing team to constantly have people come out, uh, constantly have people call. And we, the guys who go out, they don't sell one for one. They're not like me or like my brother. My brother didn't sell shit for like three months. Then he started selling some stuff but he was always leaving an opening. So when Dylan was going to the job and he sold something, who would come after? You. <laughs> and then I sell him the whole house because he's so nice and sweet that once I arrived, they were like ready. Like the wallet was open. It was just ready to go. Whatever I said, they were like, okay, let's do it. Yeah, I prepped them good. <laughs> you're good. You're, you're the best marinator I have ever met. <laughs> That's the thing, like with you, you sold Get that. Closer. With like how you said, like um, or how we were talking earlier, everybody has their own style of selling. So that's that's for you. That works perfectly. That you're you're like, you have it down. The way you sell is amazing. And then the way that I sell is, I usually go, you know, knock on the door. It's very, it's almost very similar. I don't do the phone calls, but I do go ahead and like, you know, fight for the client in person where. You know, I try to come out with the best deal for them. I do go, you know, spend a, a, a long quality time. And I also go and explain, you know, it doesn't matter what type of, you know, I basically explain to them like the type of materials you have. So basically like how you were saying is, uh, so you have different types of styles of selling. And when you sell, like that works for you. And when I sell, it's, uh, I go into a client's house and I take a lot, a lot, a long time with them, you know, explaining um, the ins and out of the whole job. And he them could stuff. stay in the lead for literally six hours. I'm yeah, not joking with you. Like six hours, this motherfucker sits there. I call him. He doesn't answer. I'm like, did they kill him? <laughs> like the first few times. Yeah, a lot like, of times when I'm, <laughs> a lot of times when I'm talking to a client, I put the phone away. People will call me. I don't even look at my phone because also when you're in a cell, any distractions is not good, especially when you're on a roll, when you're starting to talk and starting to open up. Cause like when you start a conversation with somebody, you might start it off kind of like trying to break the ice. So you're trying to make conversation. And as you're like talking, you're slowly picking up the conversation. And then as it goes longer and longer, all of a sudden you're just opened up your whole, you know, all your emotions and all your, you know, all of you to this client. And now it's just kind of like flowing. So you're basically having a full conversation. So if somebody's calling you, and you know you will answer that phone call it'll just distract you and throw you off whereas like now you're trying to get back into that rhythm and, and then the, the conversation can get very awkward again right so like you want to basically just when you're talking to a client you know you always want to laugh with them not always talk about the job you know be their friend at the same time and then as basically the the you know as the conversation progresses then you kind of throw you know a little bit talking about the job again then you go back to talking about them and their life and how long they've lived here and you know where they're from and how many you know they like dogs they like to play you know football whatever it is you always want to make small talk and then it can become a bigger conversation where the guy's like wow i have so much in common with this person i would love to give him the job and sometimes it's not always just about the pricing it's about who you are as a person and if you can basically you know show your value somebody will pay higher for you than to go with somebody who's you know, two, three thousand, five thousand dollars cheaper. I've had multiple 100%. jobs that I've came to and I gave them quotes that were like 20, 30 K over and they signed with me. They're like, you know, are you going to make good money on this? I tell them, yeah, I'll make good money. They're like, okay, I want to give you the job right. because I want you to have, you know, the blessings of my money. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, yes, yes, you'll have the people who are going to try and nickel and dime you, but also those are the type of clients that you don't want to get into work with because if you're going to be working with these type of people, they're going to basically in the job, try to scrape every penny, penny they can, or they're going to nitpick you where you're going to start putting money from your pocket. You know, a lot of people, they're like, they just want to make the sell and they, they to feel good about it. And they'll just take any job and then they get fucked at the end. Yeah. You know, so it's a horrible thing. Uh, you definitely, you know, at the same time, like when I go out to clients today, I choose the client that I want to work with. I don't let the, ch the client choose me, I choose them. So if I go to a client, if I don't want the job, I will overbid the shit out of it just so he doesn't hire me. You know, cause it's, you could see from the beginning of the conversation where the, where the job is gonna end up being. It's either gonna be in court or he's not gonna pay you 
or whatever it is, you know, or he's going to, he's going to make sure that he sucks all that money that you made, that you're going to make profit. He's going to suck it out of you and make you put money from your pocket even. Yeah. Like when you're arriving to a home and the guy stands at the door and goes, let me see your business card. And then he goes, what's your license number? And, uh, where are you guys located? He's like very suspicious. And it's very weird because these people call us. Yeah. Like yeah. if he's very like weird and suspicious, we literally just look at him and say, sir, I wish you a wonderful day. Um, for some reason, I do feel a little bit interrogated and this doesn't feel like it's a good fit for me. So hopefully you can find another company to do the job, but I'm not really interested in taking the job yeah. because you, you guys know when you do sales and construction, I don't know if you guys at the house know, but you have the three day right to cancel. So you have to wait three days as California state law before you start a job. So if I sold you a kitchen, we have to wait three days before we start it, And it has to be three business days. The, actually the three business days goes both ways. If I don't feel comfortable with the client, I could, I could cancel the job myself. And for me, the three days never really mattered because if after two weeks or a month, the client's like, I'm not interested in doing the job or continuing, thank you very much. Have a good day. Pay me for what I've done until now. And that's it. And some people don't even want to pay, you know, they'll, they'll give you a hard time. But these are like the people that from the beginning really try to screw you over. And as you are realizing it, they realize they can't mess with you. So they just want to stop the job. And that's something that happened to me only once. And that was a long time ago, many years ago. Um, I think I was like 20 years old where I started doing a job for a client and then they realized they couldn't fuck me over. So they were like, we don't want to continue the job. And then I told them just to pay me the money for the job. And then they didn't want to pay me, but it was okay. We just started doing demo. So it cost me like a thousand dollars. And I said, whatever, fuck it. You don't go to court for a thousand dollars, you know? And you don't go sue anybody for a thousand dollars. You don't put a lien on their house. It's just forget it. At the end of the day, it's money and the headache and stress that it's going to cause you is the worst thing in the world. You don't want to deal with it. So I just let those things go. But moving forward, I was very, very, very cautious. When I was doing a job with somebody, I really made sure that they were good people. Because at the end of the day, money is money, guys. It's money. I get it. But sometimes it has a price. More money, more problems. You think you're taking money from this person and this fucker will drag you to the court and fuck your life for the next five years. I don't want to be a part of that. So if I feel something off, thank you very much. Have a good day. I'm done. And there is actually a lot of people that I did love working with who are great friends of mine until today. Taking consideration, I sold my company Back uh, in 2014, I sold my company. And ever since I've been done with business, you know, I've, I just got, I went on to being a business consultant and then like a venture capitalist and investor, but it wasn't, it wasn't like doing business, 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 because I had so much money at the time. I was like, I'm going to retire. But ever since I retired, I worked harder than ever before, but it wasn't like working in an office. When you're a venture capitalist, you're looking at a business from a business perspective to see if it's going to bring positive cash flow. And if it's something that looks like it's going to do well and you believe in it, I invest money. I have partners and all these partners run the business and I don't have to do anything except invest money into the business. And I always go in 50-50. And if not 50, it's 51% because I always want to make sure that nobody could like somehow remove me out of the company. Like there's ways to remove people out of a company if they have less than 50%. Another person could say, you know what? I'm going to bring in right now a million dollars. We need a million dollars, Ben. And somehow if you don't have a million dollars to bring in, they could slowly, slowly remove you out of the business take away from your percentage 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 and eventually you have no say because you have very small percentage and eventually they just deliquify you from the business so that's not that's not something that you want if you're going to do business with somebody and you're an investor always go in 50 percent 
for the people who invest in our like 5%, 10%, I've always seen my buddies lose. So I don't go into businesses like that. I always make sure I cover my ass very well. And I'm always in control of the money as well. Like no matter what, I don't care what business we're doing. I'm in control of the money. At the end of the day, if I'm giving you a million dollars and we're doing a business, I'm in control of the business and I'm in control of the money. And I watch everything that is happening in the business. And it's great because being a venture capitalist, I'm able to watch everything from home. I don't have to be in an office. So I could be anywhere in the world. And today owning, you know, 16 businesses, I realized that businesses are amazing. Businesses are great things to have, but money is not everything in the world. And that's why I moved right now into doing this because I decided I'm going to come out and I'm going to help a lot of other people make money the way I did and in many different ways because there's many other ways to make money, not just the way I did. But I feel like there was a calling for me to come out and help other people because there's a lot of people struggling at the moment and they don't know what to do. And a lot of people are not willing to go and do sales. But sales is the best job in the world because at the end of the day, everything around us is sold. Everything. Even the best salespeople, they want to buy something. They want to purchase. When I go buy a car, I want the best car. I want fully loaded. You know, the last Lambo that I had, I went in and I fucking took the best fully loaded out of a Guerra coach in Westlake, pulled a ride out of the fucking showroom. Why? Because I like to buy just like I like people buying from me. Salespeople are the easiest people to sell to. They're the easiest because we make money and we like buying. We like to treat ourselves. And also we don't, once you become a real salesperson and you're really good and being a salesperson is not someone who's noticeable to be a salesperson. Like you don't need to be like a car sleazy ass junkie salesman you need to be a real salesman that means be a stand-up guy be honest even when you lie it needs to be like white lies like every salesman has three great stories but it's not stories so you could take advantage of somebody it's just so stories so people will relate to you and then they'll feel you know more connected to you and once they feel connected to you they feel easier to buy from you but once they bought from me I have clients that love me, love me, love me. They're family to me. And it was the best part of my business was meeting people like that. And within time, again, I left the business eight years ago and I still have clients who write me beautiful messages. Ben, happy holiday. Ben, hope everything is well. Hope your son is doing well. How is everything? How is life? We'll get on a call. We'll jump on a FaceTime call, see each other. They'll still call me to build their houses. Like I've had clients from eight years ago that didn't have much money and I remodeled their house. And then later on, I built their houses. You know, and everything that I do, I do it with my brother. Like we don't do anything that is alone. Why? Because at the end of the day, I know I got my brother and I know I got somebody I could count on besides myself. If I need something at two o'clock in the morning, who the fuck am I going to call? I'm going to call my brother. I'm going to have my brother there with me. I'm not going to call anybody else. Who else is going to answer? Yeah, I got boys, I got friends. But blood is always thicker than water. And everything I've learned in my life, I taught it to my brother. And now he's, you know, took his own path of, because he meets different people every day. And now there's stuff that he's learning, and I learned from him. And then we learn from each other. So at first, we were like, had some differences. Now, if you talk to my brother or you talk to me, you feel like you're talking to the same person. We even have the same voice. A very similar. We look very similar. The only difference when you see him is that he's got colored eyes. But at the end of the day, we became like as one. And uh, seeing my brother grow from so much as somebody that's, you know, I'm more of an extrovert. He's an introvert. And How did you say I defeat all odds? <laughs> <laughs> he defeated all the odds, guys. He really did. Yeah. I gotta admit. I was supposed to be fat, smoking weed all day. I remember coming into my brother's house. I kicked in his door. And uh, he was a young kid. He was 18. I kicked in his door. I broke his bong. His girlfriend freaked out. I was like, you're going to work. You're going to fucking work. You're not going to sit here on your ass. There's no way. I don't give a fuck that you like smoking weed. 
I don't care that you have a girlfriend that does not make you a man. You can't pay your bills. You're nothing but a piece of shit. Get the fuck up. And that's the way I spoke to him. And you know why? Because my dad talked to me that way. And that was the only way. And that's the only way that kids actually grow up and learn is if you're tough with them. Yeah, you got to have, uh, you got to be very tough. If you have a younger brother, be tough on him. If you have a son, make sure to be tough on him. You know, you don't want to grow little bitches. You want to have, you know, real men in the house. Um, I was actually just talking to one of my, uh, one of my friends and he was telling me how his son, you know, is at the house living with his uh, wife and son, um, which is my friend's grandson. And he was saying, you know, all he does is like leave the, you know, he'll work, make 150 bucks a day doing some demolition. And then, you know, he'd come back home and, uh, you know, leave the daughter, leave his wife and son at home, go outside, smoke weed in the car with his friends, like not have anything to do, nothing to look forward to. And then just comes back in the house all stoned and just goes to sleep. And it's like, I kind of remember that lifestyle because I used to smoke weed and all I did was like go to the gym, go home and smoke weed all day. Like that's all I cared for. And then I just realized like, fuck, this is what my life is going to be. All of a sudden I'm going to be 30, 35 and doing the same fucking shit. So I had to like, you know, the fact that Ben was like pushing me, making sure that I like get up in the morning, you know, he pushed me to go into the gym as well. So he like and motivated me. sure that me. he hated me at that time. Yeah, I fucking... I mean, he couldn't I, stand me. I couldn't fucking stand him. I didn't want to answer his calls. I was the devil. <laughs> I would like leave the house. I would just try to be away from everybody so I can just be like smoking weed and be calm. Because like when I would smoke weed, I just wanted to chill. And then Ben would fucking come, like break my door down. Just like made every <laughs> high experience the worst experience ever where I was like, fuck. Might as well just stop smoking weed at this point because anyways, he ruins my high every day. Paranoia hits. Yeah. <laughs> I thought either the cops are coming or Ben is coming. Either one, I'm getting arrested or getting my ass beat. I'm like, but, this is Sparta! <laughs> fucking kicked in the door. Yeah, but, By the way, I played on a TV show, guys. It was... Uh, check uh, it out on Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played on a TV show. I was Leonidas, King of Sparta, which is... Uh, it was um, Deadliest Warriors. And I played Leonidas and it was great. So, you know, for me to use that kick was always like a go-to. Yeah, like, so he kicked my fucking door down. And then, uh, but yeah, no, I would recommend if you guys are smoking weed out there, don't know what to do. I think you guys should find something that you love or like if you have an interest in something. Like for me, it was cars. I love cars, you know, so I was like, fuck, how can I get a nice car? You spent million dollars, millions of dollars on cars. I've spent millions. Yeah, I, keep, I switch cars every year, every year, two years maximum. And I'll, I'll buy two, two, two to three cars a year. But like in the beginning, I didn't know, like, you know, I was driving a shitty ass truck. You know, it was my dad's truck. I bought it off of him for like $7,000. And that's the car I was using to go down to like all these, uh, these appointments for construction and air conditioning. And I was like, fuck, I hate driving this piece of shit truck. What can I do? What, like, you know, I just wanted to make more and more money so I can enjoy the beautiful life of like the luxury lifestyle. And that, that was like a motivation for me to wake up in the morning. And I put a photo of like a Maserati in the back of my, uh, on my, on the, on my screensaver on my iPhone. And then every day I would just go and, and try and try and try. But for me, it was like, I, drew, I had some, like a goal. So if you don't have like a goal in mind, then it's like you have nothing to wake up for. You want to have something like, you know, people, how they put, you know, vision boards or whatever. For me, I never put up a vision board. I just put a screensaver on the back phone, uh, background of my phone and then just got to work. And uh, I was like, I told myself, this is it. This is what I have to succeed in it. And uh, I saw no other option. And for me, it was beneficial that I didn't try to do like plan A and plan B. I was like, this is only plan A. And I just kind of ran with it. And the first few months, I didn't even make money. As I said, I, I, I borrowed money from Ben for gas and lunch and whatever. And, you know, when I came home, I ate. But, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, for the first three months, didn't make any money. And then after three months, I finally made my first thousand dollars. And then after that, a few more months went by, I started making three thousand, five thousand, eight thousand. And that's that's the thing. You know, a lot of people, they go out there and they try to start a job or start a career of some sort. And they basically just give up too soon. You know, you can't give up, especially if you're living with your parents or if you have like a brother that's taking care of you and paying all your bills or helping you out. You have to basically utilize that and you have to you know, take advantage of that because if you're not paying bills, you have all the time in the world to kill. 
to try and make money and try to be successful and, and you know, um, in anything that you're doing. So I would re definitely recommend if you are um, out there not doing anything with your life, find something to do. Sales is a, is the number one thing, I think, because if you're selling something, you, you're making money off of commission. And if you're making commission, there's no cap to how much money you can make. Yeah, As Ben me... said, you can, you know, for you, when you go to a client, is you're basically finding out what price, how much you want to make. So you're going to put the, the market value of, or you're going to value the job at how much that you want to earn on this job. Literally. And then let me tell you guys something, you know, how he said about the fact that if you have a goal, vision boards were meant a long time ago. First of all, I don't know if you guys know the law of attraction. You have to really manifest what it is that you want. But if you put a goal and you put it on paper, you will hit it because there is a part of your brain called the reticulating activating system, the RAS. That will determine what you notice and what you don't notice. So if right now you're traveling from the gym to get to the house, if you notice everything in the way, which is every sign, every tree, every car, anything that's in the way, you will go crazy. But when your reticulating activating system kicks in, it hits a target. It tells you, I need to get from the gym straight to the house. And this is where we're going. So you're just driving to the house. And it's the same thing with the goal. And you got to push towards that goal because goals are so important. Because if you're not growing, you're dying. And some people will go through the struggle and feel like, wow, I can't take it anymore. But you've already done 50% of it. And you're in pain. And you're like, but I'm going through hell. If you're in hell, don't stop. Keep going, get out of hell, which means do not stop midway. Keep moving forward. Keep doing everything you need to do and anything in your power to be able to get to that goal. Because once you get there, it's like fucking paradise. You know, today I was talking to a guy and he told me that he watches my videos. I saw him at the gym and he told me, Ben, you look so good. And he was like, I lost a lot of weight, but I have some extra skin in my stomach that I need to cut out. And I told him, well, show me. And when I saw it, I said, you know what? You're right. A tummy tuck would probably be best for you because your abs will never come out the same because your skin is a little stretchy. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, but I hate that they have those surgeries because so many people are getting them. And they're not really putting in the work because I put in the work and I've lost. I think he lost like 50, 60 pounds. I go, yeah, you know, though, let me tell you something. When someone wears a fake Rolex watch and someone wears a real one that he worked for, the feeling is very different. You feel different by knowing that you're wearing a real one or a fake one. So he might have the same exact watch as me. And it can look exactly the same and feel the same. But the feeling inside, knowing that you bought something fake, is completely different than the feeling of what you bought that is actually real and you worked hard for it. Hard it's earned. the same with the muscles. The guys like that go and get those belly abs who just, I heard that, uh, what's his name did it? Like Liver King, he changed his abs or something. Like he had work done in his abs. Right? What is that thing called? It's a rumor. They say he had ab etching. Ab etching. You know, but if he didn't really work for those abs, he's not going to feel as great as me working for my abs daily for the past 25 years. But there's a lot of guys who do it. Like Liver King, for instance, he's actually a fit guy. Like his whole body is fit. You could tell that he worked hard for his muscles. So whatever he did was like a minor change if he did it at all. But there's a lot of rumors out there. But when there's guys who literally have just abs but no muscles all around, do you think they feel like me? Do you think they feel like the king motherfucking Azulai? Fuck no. I walk next to them, they want to shit their pants. And the reason is they know I worked hard for it and they're afraid that I'm going to tell them that they didn't or I'm going to notice that it was sur a surgery. So the same thing, guys. If you guys are working hard towards something, I know it gets really difficult sometimes. But in the hardest times... That's when you grow. And in the hardest times, that's when you find 
true wealth and true happiness. Because when things get easier, when you work very hard on something, eventually, let's say you've never done something, right? But you start doing it and you learn it. Within time, your brain starts to unlock new genes and those new genes will open you to new ideas and make things that were hard now easy. And that's what you got to go through. You got to get to the point when you're unlocking new genes. You can't expect things to be easy. If things were easy and so easily attainable, who the fuck would look at you and think you're cool? Do you think we buy Lambos and Rolls Royce and live in a nice house or buy nice watches? Because what? Why would I pay $300,000 for a car when I could pay $20,000 for a car? Because it's hard to get. And then people look at you and they respect you because it's hard to get. The same thing with our bodies. It's very hard to achieve a body like ours. You don't see everybody walking around at fucking 3-4% body fat at all times with big ass biceps and shredded and chest and, you know, looking like a fucking superhero, an action figure where I walk around the street and little kids look at me and they go, oh my God, that's Superman. That's a feeling because you're no longer just a Superman or a buff guy. You're becoming someone's hero. You're becoming, you're becoming somebody's favorite where they look up to you and the comments and the way that people could see the way that I speak and the way I speak so concisely and I know how to deliver a message and I know how to look into the camera and talk to you guys at home and look at you and not fear anything because you know I fear nothing and you know that everything I'm saying is true. Why? Because I have the confidence that we're built after many, many years of building this craft, you know, crafting every part of me in the right way, in the way that I knew that one day I was going to be able to lead many, many people and lead them to greatness. And that's what I wanted to do. And this is why we're here today. So anything that I've learned in the past 32 years of my life, I'm going to bring you guys and I'm going to bring it to the table. But the only thing I could do is I could bring the damn horse to the water, but I can't make a drink. And it's your call. If you're going to take the next step and say, you know what? I heard King Azulai and Prince Azulai sitting here talking about how hard it is to do sales, but I'm going to go out there and do it. Because if you work a nine to five and someone pays you 20 bucks an hour, great. How much money are you going to work, make later? In six months, we'll look at a raise. At the end of the year, we'll look at a bonus. Fuck, you'd have to work a lifetime to even get half of the house that I own. And that's just one of my houses. Doesn't that like sicken you? Most people today, which is the biggest problem, they don't understand the lifespan of a human today is 75 to 78. That's the lifespan of a human today. But people are born to this world and then they have to go to school for 12 years once they understand who their parents are, right? And after that, They'll spend like another eight years, I would say, to learn like a really good profession, which we know that university and college now is a bunch of bullshit. And then they'll learn a profession and then they'll spend the next 10 years paying back the loans. And now they're at the age of 40 and then they'll work a nine to five for another 25 years to retire. And at that time when they retire, what happens? They literally maybe, maybe, maybe own a house paid off free and clear and then they're afraid to do anything with that money because they worked their whole life for it so now they're stuck in the house for the next 10 years and then they die and it's so sad because they don't even go to travel because they're afraid to lose the money that they just earned over 65 years of their life and that's how you stay stuck in the matrix yeah no i have a lot of people always asking me for like opportunities to work and this and that and they tell me they work a nine to five job and then what do they say you know, oh, is it salary? Am I getting, you know, weekly checks? Am I getting, you know, paid per hour? I tell them, no, it's commission. They're like, oh, it's commission? No, I don't want to do it. You know, and exactly. a lot of people are like scared and they're like, don't believe in themselves. 
And, and that's why I'm saying, like, if you're young and you're living with your, you know, with your parents or something, start now. Because if you're going to get tied into a work and then you're going to be 30 years old looking for another job, it's going to be kind of, not that it's too late for everybody, but for some people, it's too late. Look, if you're 50 or 60 or 70 years old and you're driving a fucking Ferrari, that doesn't make you cool. You're not cool anymore. Yeah. No, game over, guys. It's done. No. You want to drive that fucking Ferrari when you're 30, when you you're 35. You might get that one 20-year-old girl that's going to be okay with you, but other than that. Yeah. You didn't make it, guys. You didn't make it. You know, if you think you're the Zeus at fucking 60 years old with the beard and the hair and the bullshit, that's not. No, fuck that. We did it very young. And we're not going to stop and we're going to give all our information here on these podcasts and you guys like i said i can bring you to the water but i can't make you drink so it's your call everybody wants to enjoy life and i think that don't just want to to do it actually do it you know a lot of people are talking about how they want to buy a nice car and this and that but then you tell them that they got to put in hard work and they're like oh well i don't want to put in hard work i don't want it that bad yeah you do right. want it that bad yeah. You just don't want to put in the hard work. It's just like people talk to us in the gym. They're like, oh, how can I get this body? And you tell them what to do, and the next week you'll see them. So did you start? Oh, no, not yet. It's because these are all fantasies in your head, but you're not really work, you, know, you, know, you don't really want to work that hard. You and just I want to look, be comfortable and lazy. And those guys at the gym that come up to me, and I see them after a month, and they're like, oh, we didn't do anything? I'm like, this is why we're here in the fucking first place. This is exactly why we're here, guys. We're here because you're not doing shit. And this is the time for you to do something. And if you're not going to start now, then it's never going to happen. Don't think that somebody's going to knock on your fucking door and tell you, hey, guys, here's a million dollars. Here's a fucking business. Here's a business plan for the next business. That's just not going to happen. Go out there and fucking get it done. Let's and, go. And this is why we're doing the podcast, because we don't want to keep repeating ourselves every single time at the gym or outside on, the, you know, wherever we see people. So you can just rewatch these videos every day and just implant. Uh, you know, as he said, you can you can walk the horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. So we're walking you guys here. If you want to drink from it, go ahead. But uh, this is where you're going to see a lot of knowledge and a lot of things coming coming up and talking about. And uh, this is where you're going to change your life. You know, you're going to hear us talking about a lot of different things and a lot of, you know, tactics of sales, how to make money, how to run your businesses, how to, you know, open up new credit cards and build your credit up and all these other, you know, ventures in your life. So if you want to hop on, you know, make sure to subscribe. And, Hell yeah, uh, subscribe because you know what's up. You got the king here. I love you all, guys. Thank you all. And we're going to see you on the next one. We're done. Let's go. Let's go. No, I'm drifting, catch you slipping, won't be back in bed. No, I'm drifting, catch you slipping, won't be back in bed. Roll the riches, lot of fishes, so we throwing this. Hide the ship in Medicaid, I hear we back again. No, I'm drifting, catch you slipping, won't be back in bed. No, I'm drifting, catch you slipping.